Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to today's water cooler chat where we all things live peer. Transcoding, delegating, gatewaying, AI inference, or developing on the live peer network. We are here to ask questions and get answers. So today we got a couple topics ahead of us. Uh, we got uh, AI optimization, RAM optimizations and speed inference, uh, the, Explo the Explorer leaderboard upgrade, as well as, um, you know, work addresses included in the metadata and some other topics. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started with, um, I guess, a couple of announcements and, uh, and quick updates before we jump into technical things around optimizations. So Papa Bear, do you want to tell us about the, the PR that you guys uh, published for the Explorer leaderboard? What does that mean and what could people look for? Um, I just basically wanted to make the announcement that uh, we've put the PR up, and I'll, I'll go ahead and post that in the chat, um, that uh, for uh, Inc. to take a look at it and uh, get that merged into the live leaderboard so the um, everyone can have a look and see how they're doing on, uh, you know, are they rate compared to other orchestrators? And then um, well, we will also, uh, we're just wrapping up the um, the equivalent of the interpreter app. Uh, or a version of it that has, uh, you know, more in-depth, uh, you know, uh, data on it where you'll get your errors um, and um, uh, um, just, just you know, more in-depth stuff like, you, you, like you're used to seeing for transcoding, but uh, specific to AI um, than the, the leaderboard itself shows. So I just wanted to just kind of make that announcement, let everyone know that um, we're on schedule and uh, should be up um, relatively soon, and we'll be working with Inc. to make that happen as fast as possible. And if I can find how to get back to chat, I can go ahead and post this in if anyone wants to take a look at the actual PRs. I, uh, edit and if anyone has any questions, happy to answer. Oh, so thanks, Rick. Can you find this water cooler? OK, here we go. All right, well, then I will go ahead and delete my post. All right. If anyone has any um, other questions. I can remove mine if you want. Oh, no, it does, as long as it's there, it's all good. Papa Bear for um, for this yeah that was that was yeah for for this um, AI leaderboard what uh, what are the challenges that you guys faced in terms of like categorizing the you know the scores and 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 these types of things well it's very different than streaming so you know um, between the you know all the different pipelines and different uh, models within pipelines. Um, and then also the way that, uh, you know, so that there's, you know, just a lot of, uh, of different types of data compared to streaming where it's all, you know, the same, it's just segment, 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 and they're all the same. Um, um, and then also the way that, that a job is handled, it's the whole job goes at one time, unlike streaming where you get a, you know, where you'll have a, um, the, the full stream, but you get all the segments in between it. So. There isn't, you know, the back and forth going continually during a, 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 a call it a job for a full stream. Um, so um, you get a round trip time for the entire job. You don't get like, you know, the individual little like segments um, for for the whole job. So that 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 was that's that's one of the biggest differences. And then um, not completely um, testing related, but selection algorithm, the way it works is just very different than the way you would uh, or what would be optimum for that is just very different than what you would use for streaming um you know with streaming if you're midstream you need to make sure you get to another orc that's known to be good so um you know you don't want to drop a pack in the middle of or drop a segment in the middle of a stream so when you have um you know an issue like that you need to you, you're the the Ten, the selection algorithm just wants to like keep this alive is the most important thing. So it'll go immediately to another orc that it already knows and is trusted. Um, whereas with AI, that is not necessarily always the the right solution, especially, and it tends to, I think it, it, it's causing in, in real world for a lot of the same orchestrators to just be chosen over and over again when there are other orchestrators that are capable of doing that same job. and for testing, since we use the you know a, a version of the uh, 
of the gateway, we had to go and strip a lot of that logic out so that we could test stuff and not have it. Like even when we were saying, use this orchestrator to do what we, you know, to test. And it was like, well, wait, wait, we know about this other orchestrator. Who's this new orchestrator you're giving us? Let us, you know, switch to another orchestrator. So, um, you know, the, the, we had a, 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 some challenges with um, just kind of like getting the, um, the jobs to go to the right orchestrator at first. Um, uh, we would send a job out and it would, you um, like the orchestrator that, that we're saying use this, you know, test this org, the job could, was originally going to sometimes to another orchestrator and um, giving the response for that orchestra, or giving the, the work was being done by a different orchestrator and then getting um, recorded by the one that, um, that we were testing. So um, we had to change that and that took uh, it was a lot more effort than we would have expected. Um, maybe Mike can answer some of those more technically than I can, but um, just kind of layman's terms, some of the things we ran into. Nah, I, li I like the layman's terms. I don't want to glaze anyone's eyes over with technical details. It's, I think you, you nailed it pretty good. Um, the other thing, too, uh, I'll add, too, for, for um, testing and, and the, the value of the testing is um, the air messages are very generic, so it's hard to really, if you do have a problem, it's hard to track down what's going on because if you get a 503 error that covers a lot of different um you know scenarios that are just kind of like grouped into one um one error so um that's something that we'll probably uh want to talk with the aisp about like getting some better um error reporting for um for for errors um yeah 100 percent i can uh, comment on that So first, really great to, to see that you have the Explorer working. I, I'm the, and, uh, I can't wait to try it out uh, on my local machine. I was already trying if I could run it. Um, yeah, so about the selection algorithm, uh, we know that it's, it's imperfect. So uh, I made a document some time ago stating some issues with it. And we currently are working with Rafal from Studio, who has uh, a lot of experience with selection algorithm from uh, the transcoding side to improve the selection algorithm. There are multiple uh, pull requests uh, that need to be merged in, some already made by Brett and also Rafal have made some pull requests. So the selection of the rhythm will be improved uh, quickly or at least uh, in the coming weeks. On the AI error handling, we already improved the AI error handling on like two pipelines. I think it's the Whisper pipeline and the trend, the energy segment editing pipeline. So now I'm back. Uh, I'm gone. I already made a pull request to do this on all the pipelines. I will share it in the chat. And after that, you will get not generic errors, but you will get um, yeah the right errors of uh, that you can see what's going on on the orchestrator side. So it was already merged in uh, some pipelines as stated in the release uh, log, and the pull request to have it on all the pipelines is ready. So, it, so oh, okay. has good, this good testing led to improvements in the selection algorithm? Is that kind of what you're saying, Rick? Um, you you mean the, the cloud testing? Yeah, I, we have um, at least we have had a lot of feedback from the cloud team, so it has influenced uh, or at least influenced the documents where all the errors are in there. Uh, but currently, this the selection algorithm improvements are still uh, being reviewed and merged in. I think it's going to be a catalyst going forward for additional improvements. I think as orchestrators are now given some insight into what regions they're passing and failing and which models and pipelines they're slow or fast on, I think you're going to start to see um, more scrutiny of the of the actual gateway results and making sure that Orchestrators see what they see in their logs. Gateways are seeing what they're seeing. So I think there's probably going to be some more selection algorithm requests coming from orchestrators. And I'm sure there's going to be some more error handling requests coming from orchestrators just so that folks have the, the, the insight now. I think they're going to start paying a, a lot more close attention to what's going on. So I think there's definitely more on the horizon.
Right. Um, would you say that um, the leaderboard is complete in its in this sense, or is this kind of just like a a V one with many iterations to come? I think for the commitments that were made by the Liepeer Cloud SPE was basically we will have delivered what we promised and had provide the framework in place to get it you know, into integrated into live here Explorer. But I think you're going to see as folks get more in, into different pipelines and different scenarios, there's probably going to be some enhancements that could be made. Um, and I think already in the chats, if we have been observing, folks have been asking questions about, you know, maybe we should have pricing in the Explorer for AI jobs so folks can see, you know, there are other requests that came in that were like, Maybe we could have a page in which we could see all the models that the network currently supports, or at least has been tested. So I think there's there's going to be some enhancement requests that are going to probably come in, and I'd imagine there might be some additional tweaks and and things that might happen to specific parts of the leaderboard. Um, you know, there's going to be questions about what does this score mean as it relates to this model, and why is this latency here? I mean, there's going to be a bunch of that, and we've been working with a handful of orchestrators in a private beta just to kind of like sort through the majority of the questions. But I think once we make it publicly available to the entire community, which is not too far off the horizon, I think then you'll start to see a lot of the same questions and hopefully we'll get to some sort of normalcy and things settle down. But we'll see how, how it goes. How many uh, job tests are you doing in a day per orc? Uh, we we've been up and down. We've been uh, we've been doing. We were doing at one point and early on. We were doing you know several thousand. You know eight. You know three thousand in a day. We would do lots and lots of tests. Obviously, it's a balance between real demand and work. Like. If we're sitting there hammering on all the GPUs all day long with our tests, that takes away from capacity that could be, you know, doing jobs and, and providing to the network. So we've been kind of watching the, you know, startup program and watching what they're doing and seeing if there's any increases there. The AISPE was doing some testing. So we're trying to balance it around all the demand on the network. But I think right now we're settled at, uh, we have three regions and we're running tests right now, at least for this week, we'll be running every other hour. So like each region is going to run, you know, 12 tests in a day for every org, for every model. So, you know, it's probably actually, about it's every two hours. So it's it's, it's two, two, every other per region. Oh, is it? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. We just changed that again. Every, I think it's every, every two. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, it's, it's we're running six tests per per region per day. So it's eighteen tests. Eighteen time periods in which we'll start testing, but every single orc gets tested for every single model that they support. Right, right, right. Sorry, A eighteen like tests is is. Is a, is a lot more actual individual tests, but uh, each org is tested 18 times for all, all of their capabilities. Yeah, I think at a given day, though, we're probably around 3,000 jobs submitted uh, to the network at, at, at large per day. But that can vary depending on how, if we increase the frequency. And also, that also varies based on the actual demand coming in, too. Oh, and you know what? Actually, that reminds me of something. Uh, going back to Titan's uh, question about what were some of the or what are some of the challenges? Um, because um, AI tends to use the whole GPU, or at least most of the jobs use the whole GPU. Um, if you are uh, doing a, a a real job or a job from a different gateway at the same time that you get your test, it really affects your test scores. So we had to figure out a way to normalize all the scores to kind of like just really focus on, on the, the, the median score. Uh, not, not focus on, but, but to use a median as opposed to an average because um, it, it, can, it really affects your, your um, you know, 
things will take twice as long if you get jobs at the exact same time or you know more realistically maybe 75 50 percent if like, you know they overlap partially um so that was another um thing that's very different than transcoding because usually you, know, you tag on one extra job your most gpus can handle that unless you're running out capacity so it's also something to keep in mind when people are looking at their scores if you see a score that's considerably higher for a test if you look at your logs, there's a good chance that you had another job at the same time that you got the test. And I'm sure that'll become clearer as people start looking at the data and it's published. So you mean if if, if there's no cap capacity available, so it gets a five or three, you will see that there's a failed test or will you retry later? No retries. Um, you, it will retry you send the job the next, in the next round. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, you get you submit a job to the orchestrator directly. The job you got to pass or fail, right? Like you got to respond back. If you don't respond back, then that's a you know a, a failure. Or if you throw an error, that's also a failure. The only way you would get a passing test at that time would be is your orc actually gave back a valid response in JSON. So anything else in that scenario would be a failed test. And what was your reason implementing it like that instead of doing, for example, trying uh, two minutes later for the same work and then saving the database on that track? No, I, I just didn't think, you know, I mean, the, the, the gateways in the, in the production environment, like the current gateways that we run, you know, they're going to retry multiple orcs and send it different orcs in the event of a failure so sending the same request over and over to the same orc in fact when we started out it was like that we had to go in and and change it but what we saw was like when a, an orc would fail it's usually like a hard failure and the only thing that happened on retries would be you know we would be sending multiple jobs with multiple ticket requests all at the same time so we were seeing you know orcs getting a bunch of tickets not doing any inference failing and still getting all those tickets. And it just ended up being about a bunch of, a bit more costly on the tester when you continually send multiple retries for a given org. I mean, again, these are things that are still areas where we probably are going to look at feedback over the next few weeks and come back and say, you know, what, what makes the most sense if this doesn't make sense or if these calculations or like, you know, uh, Papa Bear explained the, the median round trip time and things like that. As these values, we start to see it and people start to question or have questions about it. We might have to look at it and say, we need to make some adjustments to, you know, to streamline it or make it more clear. But I mean, we don't have all the answers. And in fact, it's been pretty much of a black box, you know, not knowing what to expect because we don't really have any of the data. So. This is the first time we're actually getting real data, real messages. So I think we will look at it again and reshape it if we have to. Yeah, it makes sense. So I, I, I think Peter sums it up as well. So basically, I think that's a limitation from the AI network that the error handling is not uh, done correctly enough for you to distinguish the, an internal server error and a capability error, maybe. So I thought that we implemented that with the 500 and the 503, but I have to ask to be sure. No, there are some, there are some, you know, distinguishing messages in there, but I think there's still areas to improve. I mean, I think, you know, for orchestrators, it might be a bit more insightful, the types of error messages that are there, but I think from a app builder or a consumer of the, of the endpoints for the gateway, they probably need to be a little bit more polished so that developers actually understand what's going on. So I think some of it is who's trying to use these error messages. And I think orchestrators are probably definitely seeing a lot more useful error messages than they were in the past, whereas um, app developers probably still need more granular error messages and something that's a bit more uh, descriptive for them so that they could understand what their course of action would be if retrying makes sense or if it's a system failure or something along those lines. 
Yeah, so it's a good point. So to think to get some feedback on better error assets for applications. So currently the, the new error handling that we have implemented is as follows. So you will get an error message at the application size, for example, if the GPU uh, doesn't have enough CUDA memory, I think also if the LoRa's that you chose are not correct. If you did wrong arguments, you get an error message for that. Um, you will also get the 500 for, I think, internal server error. So that's something that really went wrong inside the, uh, the, the subnet. Uh, network, sorry, AI network, and you get a 503 for capability error. So what are errors that you think can further improve the situation at the application side? Well, I don't know. Like I said, when when uh, when orchestrators start looking at their tests and they start looking at failures and they, you know, they start wondering what's going on, you know, one that probably jumps out of the top of my head would be like, you know, a gateway timing out somehow, you know, like, maybe the orchestrator was was up and running and it took longer than expected and then the gateway ended up giving up on that orchestrator um you know there might be some improvements that could be made there but i think all in all it's really going to be get the data up there let's look at some of the test results as orchestrators are starting to see okay my test not this time failed here's the the error i got back let me go to my logs let me troubleshoot it once they get in there and they start digging in and looking at the data, they might come back and say, hey, I always get this 503 when I think it should be a, you know, 502 or whatever, you know, whatever the num you know, the error message is. I think that's the kind of stuff that we, I think you've covered most cases, but let's see where, you know, we start troubleshooting it and folks looking at their failed tests and see where they actually, what they think are better error messages. But I wouldn't jump on, you know, pinpointing anyone in particular right now. Yeah, so I think that, that one that you just described is a really good one. I wrote it down. So basically, we have a 503 that uh, ha is both for our gateway timeout and it's also for a no capacity. So that is one that really can get improved. So the point that Titan makes was also the one that I wanted to go to work towards is uh, if you have a busy, a bus, busy orchestrator, uh, it doesn't mean that you have uh, uh, a non working orchestrator. So would there be a benefit to to have their separation for example have a score that uh, gives the availability or at least uh, the the amount of compute that the orchestrator can do uh, so that, that basically needs means that we have to integrate some uh, communication and brett already did that for the amount of containers that are running at an orchestrator and based on that make some availability score and have the for example the performance scores separated in uh, requests that were actually successful yeah no we have that too like the that's the one thing you'll see is like normally in the in the production gateway if the orchestrator takes too long or he throws an error it's going to go retry uh, another orchestrator so like that way you're always getting the request served even if one or two orchestrators in the pool started failing um so in our case we were like well we really don't want this whole like pool concept for testing a single orchestrator. We literally, what we did was we increased the timeouts so that we're just gonna send the job to the orchestrator from a testing perspective and wait for the orc to respond. And then, you know, with some limit, obviously, we know our tests all respond within under 60 seconds. So, you know, if we set a three minute timeout, say, we know that we're not gonna retry and go to another orc, we're literally going to let that orc run for the entire time period and either return to JSON, which is a pass, or fail and provide some error message. And I think with the, the tester works very well in that regard, that it's and it, it'll give you a pass or fail score, and we keep track of all of them. So as, as uh, Papa Bear mentioned, it's a median score. So like it's going to be the, you know, the combination of all your tests over a period of time, you know, a window of time. So even if you have one bad score, just because you were super busy, doesn't mean that your, you know, your total score as an orc is gonna drop. As long as you're still got good latency and your response times are higher than the average or the median, your, you know, your performance scores are gonna be good. Yeah, and so, 
I, I think I understand your reasoning. So the only thing, so similar to what Fibers is saying, how to ignore the tests that were not working and just return Bessie. But then it's also becomes a question, are you doing it asynchronously? For example, are you sending it request asynchronously to different orchestrators? Uh, can you then retry? If you just want the data about how performance an orchestrator is, it's not, I think in my opinion, it's not important uh, or at least to it. There should be a retry to see if it's busy, try when it's not busy again. But it's, it's a complicated issue to implement at the tester side. Uh, I can see that. Yeah, no, again, it's really at a spot in time, at a moment in time, we're going to send a test to an orchestrator and you get one shot, pass or fail. You either return a result or you don't return a result. And if you don't return the result because of an error, we'll just output whatever the org error is. And that helps the orchestrator troubleshoot. But if it's a, you know, it's taking too long because you're busy, that kind of stuff is hard from a tester perspective to determine. So we'll have to figure out a better answer for those. But, and I think that's a very, very small percentage of the overall tests. I mean, I think we're, you know, if we look at individual tests, there are certain orchestrators that have consistent errors because they're misconfigured or something like that. But everyone else tends to be, you know, pretty much 100% passing. On a rare occasion, you'll have a timeout here and there. Maybe they're, you know, it's an LA test going to a, you know, Netherlands server, and there's some latency issues that might arise from that. But really, most of the tests are going to pass. So I think it's a very small percentage of the, the data, but we'll see more of that as, uh, as we get more and more test data. Great, thanks. Let's hit the right time. But amazing uh, to see it working. Yeah, the links aren't public yet, but you know we're still going through some last bit of validations, and I think we should be through that this week. Um, but the code is up right now for the Explorer and the leaderboard. So you can help the help the teams by doing a review if you have some experience looking at Explorer, if you have some experience looking at the leaderboard, or if you're just curious and want to see what's going on, just go take a look at those pull requests, add some comments, ask questions, and you know, hopefully we can sort through all of that stuff and get it all merged and put into production, you know, sometime in October. At least that's our goal. That's a challenge, right? You know, for everybody who's trying to do some contributions, being able to know which repos are owned by which group and make sure the right groups getting the proper approval and lead, lead time so that they have the chance to review the code, make sure it looks good, test it. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of teams involved here. So it's not, you know, can be quite loaded with friction and, you know, as you start navigating through these waters the first time. But I think in general, you know, we're pretty good from a SPE working through that stuff. It just adds a little bit of delay in time and getting it ready. So hopefully anytime in the next three weeks, we should be seeing real updates from the AI subnet on the iPair Org Explorer. So keep you posted. Hey, Mike, can I ask a question real quick? I'm sorry if I missed yeah. this. You guys talked about it with like the model stacking if as long as they respond let's say they respond in a minute because they were busy with another model they had stacked from the same gpu would they have to respond slow many times for it to really impact the score am i thinking about that correctly yeah yeah i mean the success rate is the heaviest weight right like whether you succeed or fail is more important than the response time like in terms of how much weighting is, is associated to your score. The, res yeah. the success rate is very important. Um, yeah. The response time is second, but also important. But it, you know, what we've seen, at least in some of our testing, is that most people, if you have a bad test or two even, it's really not going to mess your score up to a point where you, know, you drop to the bottom of the list. Like you're not bouncing around the, you're not bouncing around the leaderboard. But obviously, sustained failures or, you know, sustained really slow responses compared to the median, yeah, then you will drop. Um, the farther away you, you get from the median, the faster you're going to drop. But that, over time, it's going to happen that way. Okay. Because I'm thinking of, like, 
periods of like using the Sam 2 as an example where there can be periods of heavy traffic and you might have it loaded on top of the, you know, a lightning model, an SDXL lightning type model. But like during that week, say of Sam 2 being really heavy, if you get any request to that lightning model, they're going to be a lot slower, most likely. You know, yeah. Start at a line that the requests come in sequentially or sequentially enough that the score doesn't get impacted enough. So I think that'll be interesting to watch. I don't have, there's no answer really right now. I mean, that's really. Well, that's what I'm saying. We're going to look at the data. I yeah, we're going to look at that data. Loads appropriately when that happens. Like they should probably unload that bite dance model or that, you know, if, if Sam 2 is hitting hard and heavy for a while, you know. Yeah, I think it's giving insight to orchestrators so that they can look at and balance their own stuff. So, like, if an orchestrator sees their response times are dropping and their VRAM usage is going up because they're they're using multiple models, then that's a that's an indicator that you're taking a hit. And even though if you're doing that, as long as you're responding successfully, it's not. Sorry, there was a train coming. Oh, <laughs> so you saved us all from the train horn. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Cool. I think it'll be really interesting as this goes on. I mean, we all want the data. We all have to see it. But I think this will, especially with multiple running multiple models and, you know, some on the same GPU to maximize returns and also being able to provide capacity to the network. This will be interesting to see how it works out over time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we were surprised with just from our own usage of some of the data we're seeing is like, Oh, cool. Like now we have the same visibility that we had with transcoding, where if we're failing stream tests and we stop getting work, you know, we know now to go to interpreter app, look at the, look at the data. We can see which segments failed or which error codes came back. And, you know, that gives you some insight into where you're going to go in your orchestrator and tweak things and, and fix things if there's something that comes up. And I think it's the same thing here where, you know, I was running managed containers and I was passing all my cold model tests because I was doing some cold model testing. And then I switched over to warm, but I had misconfigured something and I was failing. So I didn't realize I had it misconfigured, but next thing you know, a test comes in, I get a failure and I see, oh, now I can go in there and look and see when I'm misconfigured. Whereas now we get gateways sending messages in Discord saying, hey, uh, you know, orc, this orc here, you're giving this error, and somebody goes in and fixes it. But now this gives them that those those insights that were critical in transcoding that are now going to be the same for AI. So I think that alone is like gold. I think as a as a node operator. And last thing, just to be clear, like this data we're collecting and using as far as our test data, it's going into the you know. Lipeer Inc. data store. And right now, there's no selection algorithm based on AI performance. So you don't have to worry if you're failing all your tests or you're getting low you know, response times. Although it is part of the current selection algorithm, but the test data won't be factored in. So, you know, it's just a useful informational tool and a, and a way to rank against other orcs in those regions for explorers purposes. But, you know, as we start to trust the data more and hone in on all those details, we'll start to see this maybe being a, a driver for selection algorithm as well, like it does in transcoding. So to ask a question about that, Mike, so you say that um, the, there's no API currently to request the scores of the orchestrator, so you cannot uh, use the orchestrator score webhook, I think I forgot the name, maybe Brad can correct me, to use it in the selection algorithm. I mean, the, the webhook URL is part of the gateway and that's how it works for transcoding, but we haven't done any testing on that webhook to make sure that AI selection works using it. So that's definitely something at some point that this data is needed for that to 
to happen. So I think we got to get the data first. And then once we have the data, because getting the, you know, the URL you're going to send for the model and the pipeline and the orchestrator, it's already written, right? The API will have it. It's just a matter of making sure somebody goes through, configures the gateway to use it, and prove that selection algorithm works properly with it. But those parts aren't really part of what we were building. And to clarify, there's two webhooks, one to provide the list of orchestrators, one to provide the performance scores, I believe. I've never used the performance yes. scores yet, but um, the the one that's just to provide the list of orchestrators is very basic. It just You just send in the address and maybe a score, and that's it. But I don't know how yep. much score is actually used. But I also know this has come up a couple times as this uh, Inc. team is looking at improving the selection algorithm too, how to what knobs to you know include and what levers to include and when how they can be used you know so again excited to have this data I'm interested to see how I stack up with my insane list of models <laughs> I have right now yeah and again if you hit me up in in discord and I can add you to the the private beta list we don't have a whole bunch of slots left because it just becomes unmanageable with a lot of people putting issues in but i mean since we started the beta nobody's like there was one one question of, up to this point so i think it's really looking good or at least it's self-explanatory so far so i don't think anyone's had any real concerns but if you want to hit me up in discord i can probably get you a link so that you can go check the stuff out That was heavy. Yeah, I didn't expect yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, that, that was great. That was awesome. Uh, I mean, there's, there's. I, I thought, oh well, we'll get to all the comments in the chat, but uh, you know, it's uh, just kept going. So uh, no, it's awesome. That's, uh, a small little update from uh, Papa Bear's topic to uh, <laughs> full blown 50, 50 minutes of uh, of deep discussion. So uh, is uh, yeah, exciting. Yeah, no, I thought I was just going to be an announcement but i'm happy to answer questions you know we're happy to, to uh answer the questions and uh so yeah uh, but yeah it was surprising i wasn't expecting that right well that's definitely uh so so that so just to just to round off the topic was around the, the pr for the new leaderboard um and uh and hopefully getting that live so people can go look at the leaderboard and i'm almost very certain this is going to be a continued discussion as as uh, as orchestrators deploy hardware and we can you know look at the the leaderboard and determine you know how is this useful what type of hardware what type of configuration what what are we trying to optimize for and uh, have it as accurate as possible so that the network can be healthy responsive and and a good experience for for developers so uh, yeah excited to see the uh the leaderboard and and uh, have more insight into the robustness of the network. Uh, with that, with that continuation, I, I think I think uh, we'll we'll move on to a topic that's very similar, which is my uh, my topic around AI RAM optimizations and inference speed. Uh, so for for those who were in the chat or the, the thread, basically I took it upon myself to try and fit. Uh, some of the better models, I think, my personal opinion, the better models or um, that happen to be the largest what? models onto onto a much smaller card. So the the Flux Dev model, which does uh, a great job of of text to image, it it also does very well at handling text within the image. And I think that was actually a really popular model with the Flipguard competition, because you can add, you can add, you know, text into, and you can add, you know, you can make it, you can mem memify it more almost by by having text within the image, and um, and it's really powerful. And what I noticed is as we get these better models and they become more specific, they are growing at a at a huge rate. So when we first tried out like the ByteDance models and the Turbo XL models, they were taking 
you know, six ba- six gigabytes, eight big eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, twelve gigabytes. Uh, the Flex dot dev model is is taking thirty nine gigabytes of RAM, uh, which basically completely blows out all consumer grade cards. Uh, the thirty nineties and the forty nineties have twenty four gigs of RAM. The new fifty nineties, I think, are only going to have is it thirty two or thirty six gigs of RAM. So it still can't fit the Flux Dev model on it. So at that case, you need an A100, H100 to, to run these models. And the, the projection that I see is models are not getting smaller, they're getting bigger. Um, especially, I would assume, for video. So text-to-image is already at 40, 39 gigs. Like Text-to-video is, is, I'm assuming, going to be a hundred gigs by the time we get a new model out that 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 people really want. So I, I took it upon myself to see if I could figure out how to to fit the flex dev model onto a smaller GPU. There's quite a few optimizations, um, and I just I started off with uh, model offloading, which got it down to 25 gigs, which still wouldn't fit on a 3090. So I went to the 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 most optimized you can go which is uh, sequ- sequential CPU offloading, which brings down the RAM usage by about 20x in this case. So it brought down the RAM usage from 39 gigs to 2 gigs. Now, there's an interesting unlock here because there's a lot of cards with 2 gigs on it. Uh, and so now you can handle the flex.dev model on a 2 gig you know, or whatever, four gig, eight gig card or whatever. And so, so you know, it unlocks the ability for consumer grade cards to do this much heavier, uh, more more um, desired model. The, the trade-off though is you're looking at 50 to 100 time X slower <laughs> inference, right? So you go from about 30 seconds to, um, I tested it on my box at 20 minutes tested it on my laptop it took one hour and i think brad tested it on one of his boxes it took one hour so yeah there there's some some trade-offs and i made a small little post around you know if it took uh if it took uh, 30 seconds to do an inference on an h100 it would take you about 35 inferences all queued up to reach that 20 minute mark in which case, now once you have thirty the the thirty sixth you know inference queued, there's now no benefit to sending it to the H one hundred. The the inference time becomes the same if you start sending it to your you know twenty eighties that are that are much cheaper, um, and you get back the inference time in say twenty minutes. So the idea would be you can now just handle much much greater scale of 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 uh inference at much greater times but you unlock the 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 kind of the the glass ceiling of like okay it it stops at 20 minutes and now you can like scale to hundreds of thousands of requests or something because we have many many gpus handle it so anyway sorry that's that's like a long introduction to the topic and i guess i'm just kind of curious about people's interest in like this type of path of going down super long inference times but being able to handle exceptionally large models so uh, brad do you want to share a little bit about your feedback on on what you tested and what you saw yeah so um i tested it i had like a i have a 3080 ti and it's a separate machine and I, it's connected with the one x riser um, just like good old mining days, and it's got an older CPU and just 16 gigabytes of RAM in the system, and it took an hour, 50 minutes to one hour to do it on that, because what sequential offloading does, it loads each layer of the model one at a time as it needs, as the transformer like processes each layer, it loads it on, does the processing, offloads, and it loads the next one, and so on and so forth. So that's why it, that's why it's so slow compared to like. Um, the regular model offloading option, which just loads each component on and off. Um, But as Titan found out with Flux, 
the transformer itself is 24 gigabytes so it's still quite heavy even if you try to go that route um, the other big part of the flux part and as more models come out this will probably just keep going is the text encoder on flux and also stable diffusion 3 is 10 gigabytes by itself um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of things kind of going on here um, when i tried this is a little tangent sorry about that when i tried model offloading on flux i was having kind of spotty results it was it was working sometimes but not other times um, so the only thing that has worked for me is splitting the model across multiple gpus or the sequential offloading um, but to come back to sequ sequential offloading i think what will be a driver of how good or bad it works is the connection speed that the gpu is on so if my gpu was on a pci4 full x16 slot that loading onto the gpu and offloading will go a lot faster titan for yours when you got 20 minutes is that how yours is set up yeah it's in a pci 16. okay so yeah. that that might be a big driver here and how this actually performs or not and the uh what? The, the motherboard is super new it's like a it's a uh fifth was it fifth gen pci scene no so it's new hardware but the graphics card is PCIe 4, so you're kind of limited to that. But I think that would be the biggest. That and RAM speed would probably be the biggest drivers of how this actually works. I just started a test on my 4090. I'll let you know how it goes. Cool. Does it have to? Um, I mean, can is there? I, I don't know much about how how the um, the offloading works, but. Like, is there a way to um, set how much is offloaded? Like, I mean, if you had a 4090 or 24 gigs of RAM, could you offload just like what's extra or do you have to go down to that two gigabytes? Uh, I don't think there's only any being used. levers to pull on that. I mean, that's what, like LLMs have a lot more work in this area where they just kind of span the, GP, the GPU memory on it. But with the sequential offloading, I think it goes all the way to just each layer and there's no way to say hey just you know load four at a time or five at a time or whatever it is or just you know a flag that says fill up my right. memory but stop when, <laughs> when you hit that um rick maybe we can uh take a look right. at that and see if diffusers wants to take a pr to make that better yeah it's an open source library uh, they they asked us to help uh, or at least uh i Answer the question on the LoRa dynamic loading that we did, uh, and we could open a pull request to improve the performance for other products as well. So, but it's 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 a hard uh, pull request to make, I think, but we can take it. Right. What what, Brad? What was your experience with with splitting it amongst multiple GPUs? I I was just about to go down that rabbit hole, but I I just didn't because. Uh, well, it, it's just more work because you have more GPUs involved and, and I'm uncertain of like what other people's setups are for multiple GPUs. And it also just seems more, yeah, it's just more intensive. Whereas sequential offloading seems to be like really simple. Like you just, you have one GPU, mm -hmm. one motherboard, and you're, you're just optimizing for what you got, right? And I also haven't had yeah. a single failed inference with sequential offload. It took an hour on my laptop, but like it didn't <laughs> fail. It, it, log. Man, it like I, I, I turned it on. I thought it would take 20 minutes because it's got a, a 4070 in it. It's like an NVMe. Like I was like, oh, this is like a like a six months old performance gaming laptop. Like it should be uh, quick, right? That's what my mm -hmm. and, uh, thought was. And uh, I turned it on and I mean, I was like, I got to go to bed. Like, this thing's already at, like, 7% done. Like, I don't know what, I don't know what it's doing. I woke up, and it was still, like, running. And I was like, oh, God. Um, but it was taking an hour per inference. Two, two business day inference time? Yeah, I was like, uh, okay. So I was kind of surprised that um, – but I, I don't know much about laptop, um, like, how it all fits together. Like, is it on, like, a – single lane like is that like the, the bottleneck i don't know mm. I, I you know laptops are different but um yeah the, um, to answer your question 
I run both Schnell and Dev models in this way, where I would split it with the transformer on the 24 gigabyte GPU. It takes, like the 4090 has 24.5 ish actual like gigabytes to use, and the transformer will take 24.03 gigabytes, but it stays pretty constant at that after the first inference and I then split off the the text encoder at 10 gigabytes there's two text encoders for flux I split off both of them and the VAE onto the second GPU which is just a sick uh, for me it's just a 16 gigabyte a4000 and it runs reliably well and most of the time is spent on the 4090 on the transformer part so the the timing that I have See if I can, I'll go find the PR and link it. The timing that I have, um, it it's not terrible, but Pawn's A100 is faster. I think it's in the realm of like 15, 10 to 16 seconds is Pawn's A100. My my setup is 15 to 22 seconds on it, so it is slower, but not. I don't think it's horribly slower, but. Uh, Slipcard and authority can definitely tell when mine's selected versus not. What um, what model is that? The Dev Flex Dev model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can. That split can work for um. As far as I know, it can work for any any model that is like in the diffusers library. But uh, one of the differences between the diffusers library and maybe say LLMs is LLMs will can split each layer pretty efficiently, but on diffusers and um, these type of other models, like the text to image and image to image, they split by component. And the component is the transformer, the text encoder, or multiple text encoders. And the VAE are the major ones. Um, the tokenizers themselves are usually left on the CPU because it's pretty light work overall. Um, so there's a little bit of difference there. I guess theoretically you could split the transformer, but that would be a, um, as far as I know, that'd be a custom implementation of it. Right. So yeah, th this, w what I'm trying to get at is like, there's obviously lots of options, but it, it all comes down to seems like <laughs> Ram versus speed, uh, Ram versus inference time. So, right. Or, you know, mm -hmm. cost, you know, or another way of interpreting that is cost versus time, right? Like. You can go buy an H100 for thirty thousand dollars, not including all the other stuff to actually plug it into, uh, you know, or an A100, or whatever, and you can, uh, you know, uh, do these inference times in fifteen, twenty seconds. Um, or you can go buy uh, a twenty eighty, uh, and or for three hundred dollars, you know, like maybe a used one. You can get some some older hardware apparently even you know like a few few years ago and do it in 20 minutes right and um and and i haven't tried doubling up the inf like the sequential offloading multiple times on the same uh computer so i'm going to try that next where because it takes two gigs of two gigabytes of ram you know does sequentially offloading you know, multiple benchmarks at the same time is that clogging up the, the you know the PCIe lane, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna try that after, but but the question just becomes like, does live peer, does the gateway or or the live peer customer are gonna be using live peer, are they interested in that type of inference speed, right? Twenty minutes to an hour. Inference speed. Does that? That does seems that... like that would be a, a very limited use case to me. Um, I mean, that would be maybe someone who wants to batch a bunch of stuff, let it run overnight, and just come back and see the results in the morning. Um, I can't think of it. Like, I, mean, I, I don't think anyone who's like trying to just generate an image is going to wait twenty minutes just to see it, unless they, you know, like I said, it's a batch and they just oh, okay, we'll check them out in the morning. Yeah, I think it depends on the pipeline. So, for example, for the SEM2 pipeline, uh, the requests that we saw were really batch requests. So, uh, the supermodel startup sending uh, has a lot of uh, images, 
they want them segmented they don't care much uh, how long it takes up to a certain time of course so it needs to be within a time frame because if they have to wait uh, uh, 14 weeks for the results is not good but there there i think for some partners there are dispatching uh, possibilities or at least uh, use cases that we can look at and then it becomes a question do you want to integrate it in the in the, the selection algorithm uh, in the capabilities that people can state that they don't they care less about speed but they just want to get the job done up to a certain uh, timeout yeah, I, I think just right now we've only seen apps that, that want it on demand. But, you know, there's there's plenty of preemptive compute that, that goes on in the background that will other like 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 for example, the when you upload a video into YouTube, YouTube um automatically transcribes everything and, and adds it to the, the YouTube link, right? But it's not available right away. Like they don't do it immediately. Just have it like on backlog. And like two days later, after the water cooler comes out, there's there's finally a transcript available by YouTube, right? So it's just like this long tail list of jobs. They're just, you know, transcoding all of the videos that come in, but they don't guarantee they'll be done in any time frame, right? Um, and so like, you know, I and that works for trans or sorry transcribing, right? Um, it might, you know, I think text to image doesn't work well but text to video might work well in that sense like you can put you know, you can write out an entire movie and like write it out and just be like great submit that i'll come back tomorrow like i want to see what this movie looks like i'm just gonna guess if you're doing video if you think at 20 to 60 minutes for an image is a long time wait till you see what happens when you try to run a video through something like that um i mean i think you're waiting months <laughs> yeah no but, well yeah yeah don't, 20, don't, 20, 24 to 30 frames per second you know um but but what so, i'm yeah but, i think that i mean you're talking about yeah right no but this I is exactly wrong, my point it though. seems like a lot of hard work yeah. no no but this is exactly yeah. my point though is is you're like when when a new video model comes out right like a really good one that people really like sora level quality uh, you know, 60 second length or some something like this, right? Um, th that model is going to be probably hundreds of gigs. Like, you, like, unless you have a Blackwell GPU or an H100, like, you, you're not even going to be able to do the inference, right? So, so, like, maybe you are running 3090s and 4090s and 5090s, and with sequential offloading, you can barely fit it on to the, the 5090, right? Like, because it's a 500 gig model. So now you can barely fit it onto sequential offloading onto a 5090. And yeah, it takes weeks, but that's what people want, right? Um, I, I'm just trying to think of like video models getting so outrageously big. You can't, you can't inference that. You can't inference them on, uh, unless you are using like, state-of-the-art latest stuff that we don't have access to yes yeah so i think i think your point about certain pipelines this is a really valid point for example whisper and sam2 and there are other pipelines for example object detection it makes total sense to have like a patch offload for this video models it's complicated i think they they can get bigger they will get bigger but also what you see in research more i think is that they get big first and then they optimize it a bit uh, it gets smaller and then the next model gets bigger again so there is a grow in vram needed i don't know if that will keep continue because there's a lot of i think oh, it a lot of things that you can remove uh, that are not fully needed but uh, from your initial thesis i think it makes a lot of sense for the network to look at a way to provide uh, applications that want to batch with a way to specify that they uh, are willing to pay a lower price just to have the job done and also if the network is really busy and people want their job done if they don't have their time out set at the at the gateway level uh, and it gets uh, a slow orchestrator it still gives them a result Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know if this is the right direction to go, right? Like, I don't know if 
we want to supply 20 minute to one hour inference time per image. I don't know if that's what people want. I don't, I'm just trying to think, um, you know, if there is a use case for it, then LivePeer can, can offer that, right? Because we have such an abundant amount of consumer grade cards versus uh, H, you know, in, in commercial grade cards. Like we just, we just have more of that style of card, right? So, yeah. yeah. Just, just some thoughts around, up, you know, what level of inference time we're willing to provide. And also, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, it just comes down to use cases and, and whether the Live Peer Network wants to implement, you know, these massive timeouts and even try that. Just like priority. Come back to that later. It's a scale, maybe it's a scaling issue and we can deal with that when we need to scale. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm just gonna keep messing around with like sequential offloading, model offloading. There's a couple other um, gradient checkpointing, like like optimizations, um, multiple GPU offloading. I'm gonna kind of try try that a little bit and just kind of play around a bit and see see and share what I what I come up with. But yeah, this is kind of kind of stuff I've been tinkering with. Yeah, it's a very underexplored area uh, from my group perspective. We, uh, Brad did some work on it uh, and experimented, but uh, there are not many memory optimizations being done right now. Yeah, it, it just seems that if you want to reduce memory, you have to increase inference time. Um, and then, so there's that trade-off. So uh, as a network, we have to figure out if that's worth it. Um, kind of working around that or you have multiple gpus and so you're not reducing the ram but you're just spreading the ram and then then it just comes down to stability and and you know set up you know because everyone's gonna have a different setup so it's harder to surround with that but yeah anyway just just some considerations Cool. Um, with that being said, um, let's move on to the very last topic, which is Rick, you, you mentioned that the ORC address is included in the metadata. Can you explain to us what that upgrade is and kind of how it, what, what's the purpose of it? Yeah, so I, I noticed that in the pull request done by Studio, um, it's, I can share you the pull request. It was done, I think, to give the gateways away to better handle or uh, investigate uh, how orchestrators were uh, performing uh, and which one were sending, if I understand it correctly, uh, wrong images or at least uh, green. I heard from Brett. So it's, it's mainly a bigger topic. I think if we could uh, switch it to the to another or what I could have chat, but it's up to you because we have been on this uh, for a long time. Yeah, well, if uh, yeah, I mean, we've been we've been here for an hour and a bit, and uh, we've had a, quite a bit of discussion. Probably best not to burn people out. If you if you want to share it at the next one, that's fine. Yeah, and it's I will give you some context so so and then people can think about it. So basically, it relates to uh, things I saw in the chats and also heard from some orchestrators about. Uh, Providing orchestrators with a way to filter certain content. So it's, for example, not suitable for work content with, uh, uh, or also even do content moderation so that uh, orchestrators have a way to stop uh, illegal content uh, on the transcoding side. And so it's, it's a bigger topic about um, first, should this information be, uh, this orchestrator has be public in the sense that it is included in the metadata or in the next phase in the CTPA data that can be uh, added to the AI pipelines. And uh, if we think it does, um, yeah, what's the best way to implement? Or at least uh, what's, what's, your, what's the opinion of the orchestrators on um, 
adding these features on the AI side and the transcoding side. And do people have objections of having it in the metadata? So for example, I think uh, giving a great ways away to see which orchestrators had um, incorrect uh, results is very important. Also, we need to implement verification. So I already am uh, working with the research group, seeing if we can do AI of inference uh, verification. So it's it's the bigger topic. So, uh, but I just wanted to um, raise it up, and maybe you can discuss it in the next water quality. Yeah, it's a great topic. No, let's uh, let's save that for next water cooler. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, we covered that there. I'm really interested in the verified inference uh, stuff. Yeah, right now, probably just send back images of cats, and you'll get paid tickets for it. So. And and be number one on the leaderboard. <laughs> cool. Exactly. <laughs> right on. Um, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. Don't do. Let's not do that. Let's not. Well, let's not do that. Well, even even the flux dev model, you can actually remove, like the uh, the text. Like you can you can like decrease the quality of the text portion of it. Like the. And you can use eight bit like text. Uh, Text modification, like uh, whatever it is, like the layer component, or you can remove it completely. And I, I thought that was interesting because I was like, I could fit this onto probably a 3090 if I just remove that, but then, you know, the end user is not getting what they want. And I've just just changed the model essentially on expectations, right? But the, uh, but the payment still comes through. Yeah, great that you just gave uh, people a handbook to uh, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> no, no problem. No, so currently, uh, as a Mike uh, and the other gateways are looking as well to to these issues and orchestrators that do this uh, incorrectly will be blacklisted. But eventually, of course, we need some verification in place that does this automatically, so that we can really ensure that the end user gets the yeah the output that they want. Definitely. Uh, yeah, have fun trying to do the optimization, but couldn't figure it. Out. But uh, cool. All right. Uh, there's a commit for a custom device map across two GPUs. The flex dev. Now, okay, cool. That should help you yeah. save you some time. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, cool. All right. Well, with that, uh, we've covered all of our topics. Any last comments or questions before we sign off? Right on. Well, thank you everyone for being here, making LivePure the open and decentralized video infrastructure of the world. Appreciate you coming and having this conversation. We will see you all next week. Cheers. Thank you, Mike. Have a nice evening, afternoon, morning. Bye.